And uh, without, you know, last but not, not least, I, I think we should really recognize a very important man in this room who's fashionably late, but we forgive you, Peter. Um, Peter, let's have you say a little bit or two about Rio, um, UNFC, Triple C, 2020 targets, and what do we want out of this um, social summit? Um, so first of all, I'm very relieved that you and my other young friends came here um, because if it was just me, if you had to come, then you would have had much of the workshop. So um, uh, yeah, I uh, I ended up at the big tent, big white tent, and um, which is all the way through. So I stood there for a long time, long time, long time, long time. And nobody spoke English. Um, I don't speak any Spanish, right, unfortunately. So uh, eventually somebody noticed that I've been standing there for rather a long time and uh, very kindly got me. My first question is, is, does anybody have any family connections with Africa? Africa. Anybody have any family connections with Africa? Okay, thank you. So you may be aware that um, I don't have the pictures or slides, but I, I follow uh, forest fires regularly every month. I follow drought, um, a very drought on it. So um, if you imagine um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, um, about 20% of that land of southern Africa, so we're not just talking about the province of South Africa, we're talking about all the other ones, they are in an extremely severe drought. It's a vast, vast area, and I've been watching it every month, and the drought is getting more severe. Now, um, I remember as, as a boy in England, one of the um, uh, images I remember very well were the Victoria Falls, okay? Probably all heard of the Victoria Falls. If, if you go and Google Victoria Falls today, you'll see something that you just will not be able to believe. It's a, it's a sheer, massive wall. You can barely see any water coming down to the wall. If you look very closely, you'll see a triple. And there's just a little pond. I wouldn't even call it a lake. At the bottom of the wall. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to research it, but you know, the media says, well, there hasn't been a drought at all to um, dry up Victoria Falls for a hundred years, but I would guess it's probably never happened before. So, um, uh, um, my thoughts and feelings and sympathy go out to your family and people in, in Africa. It's absolutely horrendous. Um, what's be the drought in Africa has been uh, predicted by the climate models for many, many, many years. And there has been, of course, no response. Um, uh, we read that there are more vulnerable to stop me when, when you need me. Um, we have read for a long, long time, as I said, Shirley, explained, that there are more or most vulnerable countries climate vulnerable countries in the region. And we in the global north, what have we done? We just carried on a million and a million. And I'm from Canada, um, a province of British Columbia. Um, Canada is extracting vast amounts of oil from the tar sands. In my province in the north, vast amounts of uh, natural gas is being fracked. And we are building massive new pipelines to send the tar sands oil around the world. So hence it's not surprising that some people actually several years ago um, described the situation in Africa as economic genocide. It totally, totally is. Um, my people in the global north, they have been willing to sit back and say, oh yeah, poor people in Africa poor people in the Lower Black Islands, poor, poor people in the far, far north, in the Arctic. 
Oh, they're too bad. They're, they're vulnerable. Right? And stupid, absolutely stupid, these countries in the global north, their own scientists, their own experts, said, oh, we, we're not vulnerable. Um, because we are living in the temperate zone where the weather is so perfect right, for living and for agriculture. And, and we can't be vulnerable because we have incredible science and technology. So even if, it, even if climate change does begin to hurt us, we're not worried. We'll just adapt. We'll just use our great science and technology. Well, I've done the research and I've been trying to explain to these experts for many, many, many years that the Northern Hemisphere is very vulnerable to global climate change. Right? The United States is highly vulnerable to global climate change. Now that has really worried me. And I'll tell you why it's really, really worried me. Because the Northern Hemisphere, of course, is the best food producing regions of the world. Right? All the Canada, United States, breadbasket of the world, right? But also China, India, Russia, all of the great agricultural grain producing regions of the world in the Northern Hemisphere. Well, they are starting to get hammered by climate change already. In my own country, the government has just announced that next year food prices will increase 4% because of climate change. That's in a less vulnerable country. So what I've been worried about, particularly with respect to Africa, is what's going to happen when we start getting less yields from our crops and it's starting. Food prices, world food prices are going to go up, up, up. That hasn't started yet, um, but it's not far away. So what are we going to say then? You know, what are we, Global North, clever, expert, science and technology people going to say then? Well, we better wake up and start helping the small islands. We better wake up and start helping the people in Africa because we are next. Not very far down the line, we are next. My friends, as the indigenous peoples on the coast uh, say, we are now all paddling in the same canoe. We are all in that same canoe. And we had better all help each other paddling. We had better start looking if the canoe is taking on water, and we had better all deal with that. Because if we don't, we're all going down. The best analogy, actually, for global climate change that I've come across is the great ship Titanic. Did anybody read that or learn that in the history about the Titanic? This was a great ship built in Britain, where I come from. Um, uh, the one, most wonderful, opulent, huge ship ever built, right? The ship that was completely safe because it had all these automatic water type and palms. Um, a ship that was driven by massive amounts of coal being shoveled into the engines, right? A ship in which, um, uh, when, uh, and the captain was with them, um, uh, they, they had one set of binoculars on the Titanic. Because why worry about lots of binoculars? This is a ship that can't sink, right? And the story of the Titanic is such an analogy to our situation at the moment. And I stress that our situation is brought on by my by the people that live in the world. Right. We, we are responsible. And we've not got the message, you know, that you, if you're responsible for changing the climate and acidifying the oceans, it, it, it's really not very smart to relax and sit back because you think the people that are not responsible are going to be hit hardest. It's always been wrong. It's always been lousy, lousy science. And it's most unfortunate that our politicians uh, uh, in the Global North are pretty fixed in their idea that, hey, no problem. 
Um, uh, well, we're all going to... Uh, we, a lot of people are starting to wake up, right? Uh, I mean, this is not all a bad news story. Um, I've been director of the Climate Emergency Institute for 10 years, and now we have emergency declarations everywhere. everywhere. I think we've got 90 million people in the world now who live in regions where a climate emergency is being put in. So I will stop there, and um, uh, if there's any questions about climate change or ocean change, I'd be delighted to